Sproles, the president of the New York School of Interior Design. Welcome to our lecture this evening titled Charles Lebrun and the Image of Louis XIV, presented by Dr. Wolf Burchard. I am so pleased to extend a special warm greeting to tonight's program co-sponsors, the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art and the Royal Oak Foundation. If you're a member or of either of those organizations or both perhaps, warm greetings and welcome. Uh, to our guests who may not be familiar with the ICAA and the Royal Oak, the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art is a national organization dedicated to advancing the classical tradition in architecture, urbanism, and their allied arts. And the Royal Oak Foundation is an alliance of American citizens supporting the mission of the National Trust of England, <coughs> Wales, and Northern Ireland, which is Britain's largest heritage organization. So, this evening, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Wolf Burchard, who is an art and architectural historian and a specialist in 17th and 18th century royal patronage. He is currently the British National Trust's furniture research curator and previously served as curatorial assistant at the Royal Collection Trust, where he assisted Desmond Shaw Taylor, surveyor of the Queen's pictures, in curating the first Georgians, Art and Monarchy 1714 to 1760 at the Queen's Gallery, Buckingham Palace, commemorating the tricentennial of George I's accession to the British throne. That was a very long sentence. Um, he studied at the universities of Tübingen, Vienna, and the Courtauld Institute of Art, from which he holds a MA and a PhD. He publishes and lectures on the art and architectural patronage at the British, French, and German courts. He is a trustee of the Georgian Group and a member of the Events Committee and Editorial Panel of the Furniture History Society. I want to let everyone know that following the lecture, copies of his book, The Sovereign Artist, Charles Lebrun and the Image of Louis XIV, will be available for purchase in the back. And it's a fantastic book. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, I strongly recommend you visit the table after the lecture. So without further ado, Wolf. I hope you. I hope you can all hear me. Um, oops! Now this is. Oops! Now I've broken it. Um, is this? Is this also a microphone? I don't know. This is. Sorry, <laughs> literally just broken. It. <laughs> Do you think that's all right? Yeah. Can you can you still hear me if I'm here? Because okay, brilliant, good. Well, thank you very much, David, for this very very um, kind introduction. It really gives me enormous pleasure to be here today. Uh, and to have been asked to give this lecture um, for these three uh, institutions together. And many people have been involved in organizing um, tonight's lecture, but I'd like to single out Alexandra Hoyle, who uh, put me in touch in the first place with the ICAA, and in particular, Adrian Taylor, who, without whose enthusiasm I certainly um, wouldn't be here, and who's been so um, incredibly kind. We had a couple of conversations over the phone, and he was so enthusiastic. I don't think he's, I think it's, Nobody's ever been so enthusiastic about uh, my book, so I thought, oh, I'm definitely, uh, definitely going to come um, and lecture here. So it's, it's an enormous pleasure. Thank you very much, um, Adrian. Now, let's um, get um, started. Um, um, Versailles. Um, people quite often ask me, um, why Versailles? And um, there's a very um, short answer to that. Um, I grew up in a little village just outside Versailles. And uh, to this day, my mother maintains that my keen interest in Versailles results from the fact that the day I was born, the ambulance that picked her up uh, to take her to hospital uh, took a wrong turn. And so the first thing I saw was the skyline of Versailles. It was a very foggy day, so it was the skyline of Versailles coming out of the, of the fog and mist. Now, it's a very um, romantic image, but uh, uh, there is an apocryphal element to that because I was born seven hours later in hospital. Um, <laughs> But I did, I did always have uh, quite a keen interest in Versailles. And even as a child, my mother took me to Versailles whenever I was in a grumpy mood to lift my spirits. Um, and then um, when I, and, 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 and a key thing for me was um, visiting European royal palaces uh, in my teens and 20s and, and 30s. Um, I, Versailles was always the palace against which I measured all the, all the palaces that then um, I um, visited. And it's always the palace to which I um, came back. 
And then when I studied um, art history, I started to take an interest in this man. This is our, our great hero for tonight, Charles Lebrun. And this is a wonderful portrait bust, terracotta portrait bust, in the Wallace collection by Coisevaux. And it shows Lebrun at the very height of his power. Now, Charles Lebrun was a, a man of power who accumulated every key appointment in the art administration of uh, Louis XIV and his minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. He was principal painter to the king, director of the Gobelin Manufactory, director of the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. Um, he was surveyor of the king's pictures. So a very, very influential man, but also a man who gradually gained this power at the French court. He came from relatively humble origins, the son of a fairly mediocre sculptor. Um, and it is thanks, he was, he was then discovered, as it were, uh, uh, quite young by the Chancelier Seguier, the Chancellor of France, who sent uh, Lebrun uh, to Rome to be trained at the beginning of the 1640s. Um, so Lebrun was born in 16. Uh, 19 and went to Rome in the early 1640s. Now, most French artists who were sent to Rome in the, 17, in the 17th century uh, were always very happy to stay there um, and uh, didn't really want to come home because they were far away from the patrons who picked up their bill and were able to enjoy uh, Roman life and art. Now, Lebrun was very different. He really wanted to return to Paris because he wanted to make a name for himself. So he repeatedly wrote to Sigi and said, can I now come back? I've seen the Vatican, I've, I've, um, I've studied the antiques and uh, Raphael and his contemporaries and contemporary Italian art, i.e. The, the Baroque art of the 17th century. Can I please come home now? And eventually he was allowed to return. And so in the 1650s, Lebrun made uh, a name for himself as, as an artist in Paris. Um, working for a variety of, of different clients. And, and he was a very, very versatile artist who, was, uh, who knew how to please his, uh, his patrons. Now, the interesting thing about Lebrun is that you will find that there is relatively little literature about him. In fact, um, I, uh, I, um, I, I'd like to claim that this is the first English monograph type of publication on uh, Charles Lebrun. Now, there's two reasons why there is relatively little literature on Lebrun, certainly hardly any uh, literature in English. And that is, first of all, um, Lebrun is very, very closely associated to uh, Louis XIV. And with Louis XIV comes all that political baggage that comes with uh, absolutism, the absolutism that led to the French Revolution. So whenever the style of Louis XIV, the art of Louis XIV, was in fashion, so was Lebrun, and when the Sun King wasn't in fashion, nor was um, the uh, great artist. There's another reason, sorry, there's another reason why uh, I think uh, Lebrun is not very well known uh, outside France, is because the French have the monopoly on the works made by Louis XIV. Because he worked primarily for the crown, <coughs> most of his works are still at the Louvre and Versailles. I think... I, I, as I was walking here, I was sort of trying to guess uh, a percentage of works of his oeuvre that are outside France, and it's probably 10%. So the majority of the works by Lebrun are in France. This is why um, the, uh, he's relatively little known outside France. When, you know, you have endless publications on Versailles, and obviously he should be on par with all the great artists of 17th century, Rubens, Poussin, uh, Van Dyck, and Bernini, and yet... Um, there's hardly any literature about him. So as uh, an undergraduate student, um, I, was, I did a course on um, classicisms at the Courtauld Institute. In fact, in the audience are two friends of mine who attended the same course. Um, and um, we were given a task to write about a subject related to, to that course. Um, and I took a particular interest in the lectures that Lebrun gave at the Royal Academy, often described also as an academic doctrine. And on the right, I'm showing you here two uh, drawings from Lebrun that shows the, the so-called expressions of the passions. Because Lebrun, following his great master, Nicolas Poussin, believed that old master paintings, um, history paintings, should be legible, should be read like a story, like a poem. And therefore, he created something that could be described as a catalog of human emotions, which you could use in order to read um, these pictures. So on the top, you have... Uh, you have, whoops, sorry, now this is, I'm going back. So you have uh, fear, 
and here sadness. And there was some literature on, uh, or there is uh, 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 literature on uh, Le Brun's uh, lectures at the Academy, but what I was interested in is how did, uh, how did his lectures actually uh, relate to his own artistic output, because he was a painter in his own right, and does he actually stick to the rules that he set? And so when I was writing this essay as a good uh, a BA student, I went to the shelf in the library to see, uh, you know, to, to, to find all the books that there were on Le Brun, to find that there were hardly any books on Le Brun. The, um, the last publication, uh, important publication on Le Brun, was an exhibition catalog dating from 1963, when the last great Le Brun exhibition was mounted at Versailles, and the last and only really important monograph on uh, Le Brun, uh, dated from 1889 by Henri Jouin. And I was rather surprised by that. So when it came to um, writing my uh, PhD, I thought, well, I will uh, look at Le Brun. And as I said earlier, Le Brun is subject to fashion. So while I was starting to write my PhD, and can I please emphasize in this very context that my book does not read like a PhD thesis. Um, <laughs> um, when, I, um, when, I, uh, uh, when I started uh, working on Le Brun, uh, so too did, uh, or they, they had started uh, much early on, uh, focusing particularly on paintings, two curators from the Louvre who mounted last year at the Louvre Lens, which is a satellite museum of the Louvre, just um, close to the Dutch border, uh, they mounted a fantastic exhibition on Charles Le Brun. And some people were really rather critical about the fact that the exhibition about so important an artist took place in a satellite museum of the Louvre and not in the Louvre itself, uh, which meant that not terribly many visitors came. However, um, that had one advantage because the pictures were displayed in these very modern surroundings. And that was very important. That was very important for the uh, curators of that exhibition, because it, stri it, it took Louis, uh, it took Le Brun um, into, uh, into put him into focus. You had the possibility to focus on his canvases, on his own brush, and and that was very very important. Taking Le Brun out of the shadow cast by the Sun King, because the exhibition 1963 at Versailles was. Um, Le Brun in his natural environment, as it were, surrounded by golden frameworks and marble, etc. So that was rather wonderful um, for, for those people who went to see the exhibition to see uh, the, the high quality um, of um, Le Brun's work and to make one really important point, that is Le Brun is a great artist. Because the problem was that with that political baggage that I mentioned earlier, um, Many art historians, many very distinguished art historians, thought there was part of their uh, discernment to claim that Le Brun was just a second-rate artist. The great Anthony Blunt said that Le Brun wasn't a great artist, but he was a dictator of the arts in France. And that was a term that he used in spite of the fact that he knew that obviously it was totally um, anachronistic. But what this show has shown is that Le Brun was a, a great artist in his own right. And this is one of the pictures that um, I think is one of the great pictures of the 17th century, which is at the Louvre, uh, a, a Sacra Conversazione, the, 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 the Holy Family. Uh, it's not a very large picture. It was painted in the, in the 1650s when Le Brun had returned uh, from Rome and was able to focus on painting, establish him, himself as a great uh, master. And you can see here, if you, if you see the, 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 uh, the, the geometrical um, composition, uh, of the figures um, is, is very much inspired by, by the, the work of, of his great role model, Nicolas Poussin. But you also have here, I mean, look at that. Oh, sorry, I'm getting used to that. Um, here, look at the, the quality of that Christ child, the weight of this. This is like a marble sculpture. You really feel the weight of a sleeping child. And that really shows that here we have, we're, we're really talking about one of the uh, great artists of the 17th century. Now this here is a, this is where the French and the English sort of, um, they're, they're, there's a sort of slightly sore wound here because this is the great Jabach family portrait which some of you may have noticed that the Metropolitan Museum just published their bulletin on because this was one of the great acquisitions of the Metropolitan Museum uh, two years ago thanks to the <laughs> generosity of uh, Mrs. Charles Reitzman. This is a, a portrait of uh, Ewart Jabach who's, um, no, I'm not going to make the same mistake again. Uh, this is 
uh, this gentleman here, who was an incredibly rich and powerful merchant in, um, uh, in, in Paris, uh, in the middle of the 17th century, a great art collector. I think the only man who can claim that he was portrayed by Van Dyck, uh, Lely, Lebrun, and Hyacinthe Rigaud. Um, a great collector and uh, of German descent who had his family in Cologne and had Lebrun produce two uh, versions of um, this picture, both of which were sent to Cologne after his death, one of which remained in Germany, uh, uh, eventually ended up in Berlin and was destroyed in the war, and this version here that ended up in a British country house where it was for 150 years. Um, and it was... Um, and it was then recently acquired by the Met. And uh, I can tell you that neither my French nor British colleagues make, uh, make, um, uh, 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 are particularly subtle or diplomatic about the fact that actually they feel that it should be uh, either at the National Gallery or at the Louvre. But I think it's, it's wonderful. It's here, um, especially since, as I said earlier, uh, the, the French have a monopoly in terms of works by Lebrun anyway. But this is a picture, and I, can, I really encourage all of you in this room to go to the Metropolitan Museum as soon as possible to see this picture in the flesh, because that really shows you that Lebrun is a great painter. So this is, so this is, our, this is our man, Charles Lebrun. It's a portrait by Nicolas de Largillière uh, in 1686, uh, very much when he was um, the, the most powerful artist uh, in France, when he had just finished the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. And you can see here, this is, the, uh, this is one of the modellos for the ceiling, so he's pointing at his great patron, uh, Louis XIV. And so there were two questions that I asked myself when I wrote um, the book, um, because, um, uh, yeah, there were, there were two questions I was interested in. As, with a starting point of Anthony Blunt's uh, comment on him as a dictator of the arts of France, I wanted to know um, how can you actually uh, describe Lebrun, because he is a powerful artist, but how does he actually try and translate the king's claim for absolute sovereignty into a visual form. So what is that relationship between the king and his patron? And then the other question was, how do Lebrun's different fields of activities interrelate? Because um, I think the show at the Louvre, they had a little bit of decorative arts and drawings, but it was, again, primarily on painting. And the literature that exists on Lebrun is really looks at his different fields, of acti different fields of activities separately. So you have uh, literature on his lectures at the academy, literature on his painting, literature on his drawings. But I really want to know how his different appointments um, work together, and especially the relationship between the fine arts of painting and the um, decorative arts or crafts of tapestry weaving, uh, carpet weaving, furniture making, etc. So um, a starting point, if you ask yourself, how does, how does Lebrun portray Louis XIV? How does, he, how does he capture the king's sovereignty into visual form? Uh, a, a starting point is obviously always the visual portrait. Now, this here is a publication by uh, a French uh, uh, intellectual, Louis Marin, who produced this book, Le Portrait du Roi, The Portrait of the King. And that has been, it was published in uh, 1981. It's, uh, it's quite a difficult book, quite new art history. Uh, it's, um, it's, but it's been a seminal account for the study <coughs> of royal portraiture of the 17th and 18th century for the, for the last generation of art historians. And what he discusses in this text is a pamphlet written by a contemporary of Charles Lebrun, André Philippien, who was the historiographer of the French Royal Academy, and who wrote a pamphlet about a portrait that Lebrun made of Louis XIV. So it's a text, a description of a painted picture. And Louis Marin discusses that in, in the context that you have four different layers. You have the text the textual portrait of the portrait that was painted. The portrait that was painted is obviously the portrait of the king, which is the third layer, or the, the second layer as well. And then the portrait of the king himself is the portrait of God. So you have these four layers. You have God, the king, the painted portrait of the king, and the written portrait of the painted portrait. <laughs> and what's so interesting is that, um, that uh, Louis Marin, there's, there's two th things that struck me when I, when I read the text. The first thing is that at no moment does um, Philippien in the original text actually mention Lebrun. He never says 
Lebrun, he always refers to the king and to the painter. And that's very important because Lebrun, this is exactly what Lebrun thought. It was, an, it was a monopoly. He was the only painter who could capture the king's image. So uh, we all know Louis XIV you know, is said to have said, one state, one religion, one king. And here we only had one painter. And the other thing that struck me in Louis Marin's uh, uh, discussion of that, uh, uh, of that pamphlet is that he never actually talks about the picture. Why is that? Because the picture was lost in the revolution. But we have numerous visual sources that help us understand what the original picture looked like. So what we have here is a copy, a contemporary copy that is in a French museum, Musée de la Chartreuse, which is probably contemporary to the portrait that um, Lebrun made of Louis XIV. And this is possibly a contemporary um, version. I haven't seen it in the flesh, but with a later edition, this is a, this is a face of Louis XIV, probably dating from the 1710s, very close to the famous portrait by Yassin Rigaud, but it's an important image because it still has these allegorical figures that Philippien discusses in, um, in the pamphlet. And yet, um, Louis Marin does not talk about this. And what's, what this picture, or the study of this picture, has shown to me is that Lebrun, you know, he's a very powerful man, but he's also a very, very busy man. And he's very clever because he always produces all these designs, uh, but he never throws anything away. So when, uh, you know, he shows a design to the king for, for something, and the king will dismiss it, then he'll keep it and pull it out again 20 years later, maybe using it in a completely different context. And in the book, I've illustrated several examples where there was one design that he used for the bathrooms at uh, Versailles, which he then reused for Savonry carpet. Um, and this is, this is true here again. So this drawing very clearly relates to uh, the portrait of the king, but then was reused um, for a, uh, an engraved thesis by um, Colbert's nephew. And what he does here is very much to create a, 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 an easily identical visual language that's associated with a monarchy. It's like the king's brand that he creates. And that is, I mean, that, that is what today we call political propaganda, because it's really to create an image of Louis XIV. Louis XIV here, this is, this is a portrait that was made at the very beginning of the 1660s, when Louis XIV is in his early 20s. He's only just literally taken on the reins of power. Louis XIV became king of France when he was five years old, so far too young to govern himself. And then he takes power when the, his regent, the Cardinal Mazarin, dies, and, and, but still is a young man who hasn't achieved anything yet. So you have to create the image of power to, to uh, translate that he is a powerful man. So that's one way of portraying him. Another way of portraying him is to portray him as someone else. So here you have the iconic image, and I, I use this term very deliberately, of uh, the queens of Persia at the feet of Alexander the Great. And this is supposed to represent Louis XIV and his uh, grandeur and serenity. Um, what we have here is a scene that ca uh, which captures great drama. Alexander the Great has just defeated the king of the Persians, just killed the kings of Persians, and arrives at the tent of his, uh, of his wife, uh, the, the, oops, sorry, um, the queen. And here you have the mother, the dowager queen, and then the princesses. And they're all terribly worried because they too think that they will be put to the sword. And then they make the great mistake of, as you can see here, the queen gets confused and thinks this gentleman here is Alexander the Great when that is Alexander the Great. But um, Alexander the Great um, uh, uh, reacts with, uh, with a noble gesture saying, this man too is Alexander the Great because the body of the king, as it were, transcends through all his subjects. Um, and talking about the, uh, the expressions of the passions uh, earlier, uh, this is very much a picture that you're supposed to be reading. It's, um, it's probably that size in, 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 in the flesh, in, in real life at Versailles. Uh, it's sadly, because it was such an important image, it's been cleaned and recleaned and recleaned throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th century. So that the picture that we have today, sadly, and you can see you have all these shadows here, sadly. It's not in a very good um, state. But it's a very important picture, and um, the, it's, it's very closely associated with French drama theory of the 17th century, the idea of unity of time, place, and action. And the beholder, so uh, the, the, the viewer, is 
literally sucked into the, into the canvas, because when you stand in front of it, you're on the height of these, of these faces. So you read the drama in the faces of, of the princesses. And um, the idea of, of French drama theory is that a drama can only take place in the highest echelons of society, because, because only prince and princesses or noble uh, men and women can actually really feel real pain. Um, and what you, what you can see here is that these ladies, so the, the older the queens are, the more they react with, uh, with dignity. So the, 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 this is obviously very closely, you know, uh, is a quote of, a, of, a, of a, a virgin and child. But you see how they, the princesses react, and this youngest princess looks slightly worried, whereas their staff and slaves are, are completely hysterical. They don't know what to do. They're all terrified at the thought that they might be killed. This is a picture that stands at the beginning of, Louis, of Lebrun's career at the, uh, at the court of Louis XIV, and he will then continue to produce several scenes uh, of the battles of Alexander the Great and his great military actions, claiming that this is the type of actions that, um, or, or the type of, of, of achievements that will resemble those of Louis XIV. And they were then woven into tapestries. And then Lebrun started designing a second series of tapestries, The History of the King. And these were always sort of put into parallel. Um, and they showed <coughs> Louis XIV's military uh, actions when, uh, uh, in, the, in the 1660s, when he was in his 20s and 30s. And it's quite interesting because, obviously, in the French propaganda, it wasn't him bringing war to the rest of Europe, you know, but it was always him bringing peace to the rest of Europe. And this is, um, this is the last scene, which is the only scene that isn't, or one of the, you know, it's, it's not the only, it's, it's one of the few scenes that isn't a military um, scene. And it shows the king visiting the Gobelin Manor factory. So that's another way of portraying Louis XIV. We have Louis XIV here. And someone asked me uh, when I gave a lecture uh, two days ago about the quality of the, of, of the image. Uh, this, is, this is a silk tapestry, a uh, huge tapestry, much bigger than the picture we saw. This was on display in the Lebrun exhibition, and it's about, I would say, about four to five times the size of the image you see here. Huge tapestry, but it's silk, silk and gold and silver thread. Um, and the, the dyes that we used at the time were very aggressive, so a lot of the silk is highly damaged, which is why um, there are some colors that are still very well preserved, like the red here, but others that are you know, completely, um, completely gone. So it shows Louis XIV arriving at the Gobelin manufactory, of which Charles Lebrun was um, the head, and it shows that Louis XIV, in spite of the fact that he uh, goes on all these military campaigns and spends a huge amount of money on war, he can also spend a huge amount of money on art. And so you have him here with his uh, press minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, his brother. And here, this is Charles Lebrun pointing at all the things that are done according to the king's um, will. And um, one thing that's very interesting is that, as I said earlier, Lebrun is creating this, this brand, the king's uh, brand, an easily identifiable visual language. And he does what today we call copy-paste. He reuses designs that are then associated with the king and with, um, with Lebrun himself. So this here is taken, um, this, sorry, I'm really not very good at this. Um, this is taken from uh, one of the tapestries of the history of the king. And you can see here, this is a silver dish, which we know exists, and you can see that same scene. I don't know if you, the people in the front might see it. There's a, a, a man on horseback, that's Louis XIV. It's taken directly from that scene. And we know from the descriptions in the Royal Inventory that the plate looked like that because the silver furniture was famously melted down eventually um, to create funds for more military um, actions. And then the Gobelin, uh, when, when Lebrun took over the Gobelin, they didn't only produce uh, tapestries, they also started to produce um, furniture. So what Lebrun did and Colbert, they imported foreign know-how, so they imported Flemish weavers and uh, here, um, Italian cabinet makers. So they produced these. This is the uh, uh, this and oh God. Um, this and its pair uh, are the only surviving large Cucci cabinets made by Domenico Cucci, who came from Rome, which are now in the uh, collection of the Duke of Northumberland at Annick Castle. Um, and then on the right, you have this remarkable Pietro Dura tabletop, which is uh, at the Louvre, which is one of the very early tabletops made by Florentine craftsmen coming to Paris to work um, for the king. And you, uh, you can see here, you have the French um, royal arms. Um, 
what was so interesting, this is a, this is a scene, uh, all the art historians in this room will recognize the scene because it's an image that has been used uh, extensively in every publication on the production of French luxury goods of the 17th century, you will find this image. And yet, nobody, it was always used as an illustration. Nobody seems to have looked at it as a pictorial composition in its own right when it was designed by Le Brun, so one of the great painters of the 17th century. So it's, clearly there must have been more a meaning than just the king comes and looks at the goods that are made for him. And what was very interesting for me is that there was this man here in that corner who had once been misidentified as Le Brun, but this man is Le Brun. So I start to think, well, who is this man? And it turns out it's a man called Gédéon Berbier du Metz. He was the uh, superintendent of the French royal wardrobe. So he was the man who assessed the quality of all the works produced for the king. And if you look at it, you do have a, you have a triangular arrangement here with the king with his open arms. The king is the man who produced the idea, the design, in theory. Um, but he's also the prime consumer because all the goods that are made at the manufactory are made for the king. And so, as it were, you have Le Brun and Berbi du Metz as the left and right hands of the king. The, the, he is the literal, the actual designer of the king's work. He is the actual producer, and the other one is the actual um, consumer. Now, don't worry, you don't have to read this. Uh, this is just to, to make, uh, to illustrate something. I think, I'm just going to go back because otherwise you'll all fall asleep. Um, this is not only a portrait of Louis XIV, it's also a portrait of Le Brun. And it's the, the, as I said earlier, there's a good reason why people shied away from looking at Le Brun because it, he's so closely associated with Louis XIV. But that's his own fault. He always wanted to be closely associated with Louis XIV. So this is, this is a, a woven portrait of Le Brun. But it really shows you how he wanted to be perceived by the outside world. And there, is, there was a magazine called the Mercure Galant, and it's sort of something like either, it's sort of a mixture of Vogue magazine and Hello magazine. It was, it was a magazine for French society that described the ongoings at the French court, at the other European courts, and also had a little bit of gossip in there. And the, we know that the um, editor of the magazine wrote to Le Brun and asked him to produce a summary of what's going on at the Gobelin, what is being produced at the Gobelin. And that letter survives. Um, and obviously, the published uh, text survives. And what I did in the book is actually try and see, well, how do, do both texts match up? Because what the editor did, it didn't, he didn't publish Le Brun's letter um, making it clear that it was a letter by him. He just took the information, the quotes, but he wove it into another story. He wove it into a story where um, you have a group of Frenchmen sitting in a tavern having a drink. And there comes this slightly naive German who says, um, excuse me, I wonder, could you tell me about the Gobelin manufactory? Because all of Europe is raving about the Gobelin, um, but I know so little about it. Can you tell me something about them? And then the French, in their uh, sort of slightly sort of humble manner, said, well, you know, actually, we French, we don't really know very much about the arts produced in our own country. Um, and then luckily, an Italian comes in and says, well, actually, I know about the Gobelin because um, I, I actually have friends who work at the Gobelin. And then he starts talking about the Gobelin manufactory. And that's when Dahl starts to quote Le Brun. So, so you can see it here, all the blue text here, and it's reproduced back of the book, is is the direct quote from um, Le Brun. Now, why is this so important or interesting is um, that um, this is how Le Brun wanted the manufacturer wanted to perceive. And, and the terms that are used in the text introduced by Monsieur Don is that Louis XIV is the greatest monarch of the universe. That's a term that's often being used. These superlatives, there's lots and lots of superlatives. And obviously, Le Brun is the only artist who could translate the king's will. But all that is put into the mouth of the Italian. So it's an Italian who acknowledges the fact that Louis XIV is the greatest monarch of the universe, the greatest patron of the arts. And that's very important because France sought supremacy over Rome in artistic terms. They want to be the rightful heirs of ancient Rome. So it's very important that it's an Italian who acknowledges that. Why was it a German who asked that question? Well, being a German myself, I was rather curious about this. And um, I must say that the, the, the Germans didn't, you know, they were always considered, well, by some still today, as Philistines, or certainly by some French people. 
And, and I can say that having grown up in France. Um, and indeed, the, 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 German, the term for German in French, uh, Allemand, at the time was synonymous for an ignorant, someone who didn't know the prices of things, uh, and obviously always associated with Gothic architecture, etc. So, um, so it's very key that there is the naive German who asks the question, and then obviously the erudite Italian who gives um, the answer. But I think there may be, um, and maybe I get, I'm getting lost in um, national stereotypes here, which personally, actually, I don't particularly like. Um, I think there may be another aspect to that. This is uh, a drawing uh, from 1665, which is very closely associated with one of the most important chapters of French art history. This is Bernini's design for the Louvre East Facade. Gian Lorenzo Bernini was summoned by Louis XIV in 1665 to design a facade for the Louvre. That was before, long before um, Versailles was the principal residence. The Louvre was the headquarters of um, the mo French monarchy. And every French artist had failed to produce a, uh, a, a facade for the Louvre, and so Bernini was asked. Bernini comes to Paris. Uh, he produces three desi uh, four designs. This is the first one. And obviously, this design wasn't taken. It was far too Roman, far too impractical for the inclement weather conditions in Paris. Um, but the key thing is that uh, Bernini uh, goes to the Gobelin, he goes to Versailles, he portrays Louis XIV, and he's incredibly rude. And uh, he's very rude to all the French artists. And you can, when he left Paris, you could sort of hear this gasp of relief amongst the French that this man had finally left. I mean, I'm sort of slightly, you know, exaggerating. But, um, but, it, but, but and it's often actually been said by some art historians that this was almost a staged visit, that this was going to, by, by the French, that this was going to the moment where the French would seek in artistic independence from Rome. Now, going back to that story about the German, um, Bernini repeatedly, and we're very well informed about his, uh, about his visit because of the diaries of Chanteloup, and Bernini repeatedly mentions uh, someone. He says, you know, Lebrun, um, he's very distracted by the Gobelin manufactory, which is true. Um, there's hardly any easel paintings by Lebrun from, uh, from the 60s and 70s because he focuses on the Gobelin and on the royal building sites. He says, well, you see, he doesn't really focus on, on the paintings. Maybe we should find someone else to be the director of the Gobelin. You see, I have this very good man in Rome, uh, Giovanni Paolo Tedesco, a uh, German, so um, uh, uh, Jean Paul the German, uh, Johann Paul Schor. Uh, he could come and run the Gobelin. And Bernini says that several times. It never happens, and I'm sure that Lebrun was not going to have any of that. Um, but it's very, very interesting that, that this is a, a German who could have potentially taken his job at the Gobelin. So this is, this is um, Bernini's design. And when I look at it, I, I can't help. The first thing I always think when I see this design is um, when we think of Paris today and the long avenues and the buildings designed by Osman, they're all reminiscent of the French architect of the 17th century. So they're reminiscent of this. This is the Louvre East facade as it was then um, delivered. And can we ask ourselves, well, had Bernini built this, would Paris today look like Rome? Um, this here is, is, the, is, this is the, the, the facade that was eventually delivered. After Bernini left, um, <coughs> Colbert said, OK, we're going to bring um, the three, I'm going to bring three artists together. And they're going to develop, they're going to design the Louvre's facade. And this was the architect Claude Perrault, Louis Levaux, the architect of Versailles, and Charles Lebrun. Um, and it's interesting because we have all the paperwork that relates, relates to that commission. And in the paperwork, Lebrun, uh, Colbert specifically says, the three of you will work together and none of you will be able to take credit or authorship to the detriment of the others. So this is going to be collaborative work. And it's quite ironic because architectural historians throughout the 20th century have debated whether this facade was designed by Claude Perrault or Louis Levaux. They've always sort of ignored um, Lebrun. But um, so you have that text, and Colbert makes it very clear. I don't want anyone to be able to claim authorship. And then in the next paragraph, he says, oh, by the way, Lebrun is going to look after the sculpture. He's going to design all the sculpture. So Lebrun produces his own designs. And you can see this is a painter at work, a painter who designs architecture. And he completely covers the facade with sculpture. It's like a canvas, like a blank canvas that he uh, covers in sculpture. And the sculpture would obviously would have been associated to him. So we can see this here. Um, he, Lebrun, as opposed to Bernini, has always been criticized for 
for an iconography that wasn't very focused. Le Brun's very, uh, Bernini's iconography is always known to be very, very complex and focused on one particular theme. Le Brun uses all the vocabulary that's available, and that works here because Colbert wanted him to create a palace that reflected the universal claim of Louis XIV. He said, I want the Louvre to be an abrégé du monde, a summary of the world, that, that, that if possible, reflects the grandeur of the sun king who lives in it. And he went even so far, he said, well, uh, when we expand the Louvre, I want to have rooms in all the styles of the nation of the world so that all the envoys that come to see us uh, feel at home. So I want a room in the German style, in the Turkish style, in the Italian style, uh, in the Persian style. None of it uh, actually materialized. But this explains the iconography that, that Le Brun uses. So he has, you know, it's, it's sort of, he sort of, combines various things. You've got Louis, the bust of Louis XIV here, flanked by slaves. You have Minerva and Hercules, then the Dioscuri pointing up to Louis XIV. And that, again, this is, the, this is the painter at work who uses, you know, he thinks of the, of the beholder looking and reading the um, facade. You have the, the French royal arms are flanked by, um, by uh, trumpeting fames. You've got the name of Louis XIV, which is very important because that brings in uh, an almost sacred element because usually you only have that on uh, churches. And then you have the chariot of Apollo, uh, the sun god, and obviously here this idea of the palace um, of the sun. None of that um, materialized, but it really shows you how Le Brun uh, imagined um, architecture. And here you can see the, the detail a little better. Um, there's another building site on the Louvre, at the Louvre which was really relevant for um, Charles Le Brun. And um, this is just to give you an idea what the Louvre looked like in the 17th century. This is, a, this is an engraving of the 18th century. And you can see the Louvre wasn't finished. This is the Louvre as we know it, but you can see there, there all the, the roofs are open here. Uh, this is where the pyramid is today. And this is the Tuileries Palace destroyed in the 19th century. And here you've got this very, very long gallery, the long gallery of the Louvre, 445 meters long. And some of you will uh, recognize it. It's the gallery with the Italian uh, Renaissance pictures. And uh, here you've got the door that leads to the Mona Lisa. So this room existed already in the 17th century. It was designed, uh, it was built by Henry IV, the fa a grandfather of Louis XIV. Uh, and then uh, Louis XIII wanted it to be um, decorated. Um, what we have here is, uh, is the only uh, color depiction of that space dating from the uh, 18th century. And um, it's, quite, um, it's quite funny that, because this is the uh, longest um, secular space in Paris, a huge space. And this visual record is the reverse of a snuff box. It's that size. It's absolutely tiny. Um, but what it shows you here is the decoration of the vaults, which is really, really important. So you see this golden decoration with these roundels and here these, uh, these green elements. And this was deployed um, and designed by Nicolas Poussin. Nicolas Poussin, who was principal painter of the king, Louis XIII. So he was the predecessor of um, Le Brun and the great role model um, to Le Brun. He is one of these French artists who went to Rome and didn't want to come back to Paris. However, um, Louis XIII, the father of Louis XIV, um, summoned him to Paris in 1641 and said, I want you to come and be my principal painter. So Poussin reluctantly accepted and came, but he couldn't really say no. And Poussin is very well known for small, highly complex, highly intellectual canvases. And he arrives in Paris, and the first thing that the king says to him is, you're going to decorate the vaults of the Long Gallery of the Louvre, which is 4,000 square feet of worth of, of, of space to decorate. So I think that must have been a very frustrating task for uh, Poussin. We have here, this is one of, a, of the drawings by Poussin himself, uh, which is at the Hermitage. And he created an iconography about, around Hercules, because the king of France uh, claimed that there were direct descendants of Hercules. Um, and combined those with plaster casts taken from the column of Trajan in Rome, which he had brought with him, um, because Louis XIII claimed to be the new uh, Trajan. Um, and so he starts the decoration, and he um, works down. So there are 45 bays, and he's done nine bays. And then he says, 
You know what? I think I uh, I better go home and to Rome and pick up my wife. I'll I'll come back later. Uh, and then, needless to say, he never returned. <laughs> and then Louis the Thirteenth dies, and then uh, no, uh, Richelieu dies. Louis the Thirteenth dies, and then the the uh, gallery remains un uh, uh, undecorated. And then another gallery adjacent to it burns in the 1660s. And so the, but when rebuilding this gallery, the whole issue of the, of the long gallery reoccurred, uh, and Colbert and Lebrun discussed that uh, problem. And Lebrun saw an opportunity here, because the gallery was divided into two uh, almost, uh, spaces of almost the same length. And he said, well, let's finish the first half of the gallery in the style of Poussin, and I'm going to deal with the second half of the gallery. And that's very important, because that gave Lebrun the opportunity to compare himself to his great Rome model. So what we have here is a watercolor, uh, which is at the Albertina in Vienna, um, which was made presumably by the artist who carried out Poussin's work, uh, Louis de Boulogne. And what does Lebrun do? He um, designs this. This is, um, this is a subject I could um, give a separate lecture on. Uh, these are huge Savonnerie carpets, which uh, Lebrun designed for the Don Gallery of the This absolutely unique commission in the history uh, of art or in the history of European art. This is a version that's at the, um, this is one that is in the, uh, uh, at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, also a gift by Mrs. Reitzman, but in the 1950s. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea, these are, these are nine meters, they're nine meters long, so it's much bigger in the flesh. Um, and then the width varies. There were 90, well, 103 carpets were woven. 93 were needed to cover the entire floor of the gallery, but Louis XIV kept giving them away as diplomatic gifts, so the weed of us had to start again. Um, and they're very interesting because they all follow a similar pattern, so a black background with these scrolls, and then they either had at each end these allegories, in this case, uh, music of the arts, uh, or uh, a landscape. The ones in front of windows had landscapes, and the one in front of a wall had an allegory. And this is again that idea of bringing the iconography of the entire world into one space, into one uh, room, the Louvre, or one palace, the Louvre here. So he spreads out the iconography of the universe. And that's very interesting if you think of it, because so this is, this is a, 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 a model that I, um, a, a digital um, a recreation that I commissioned for the book, and it gives you that sense of how the carpets would have laid out, been laid out. It took 20 years to produce all the carpets. They never, were never laid out in their entirety because Louis XIV lost the, the interest in, in the Louvre and, uh, and moved to Versailles. Um, so we, we, we can only imagine how they would have uh, been um, rolled out together. Um, but it, I think that idea of, of a universe is really interesting because rather like the universe, when you stand at one end of the, of the gallery, you can never see the other end of the, of the universe, of the, of the carpets. Um, and what is also is interesting is that it, the idea was to bring the whole world together in one room. In fact, in this room was a ceremony for the touching of the king's evil, where all those deceased of um, scrofula came to be touched by the king. And the, 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 the ill were uh, arranged according to their nations, with the Spanish as the first and the French at the last and the other nations in between. And the king would then go and touch their heads um, and say, you know, the king touches you, God heals you. But it really was a space that was supposed to bring the whole world together. Um, and it's interesting, the irony is that these carpets now that you see rolled out here in, in digitally in the right order, they're now in completely different parts of the world. So, so the first one here is the one at the, at the Met, the next one is at Volvicourt, the next one is at Versailles, the next one is at Louvre. So they're all in different um, places. And this is yet another one that's in a different place. This is the first carpet of the series. And this I very much see as a frontispiece, like the cover of a book that advertises what's going to lie uh, behind. This was in, a, in an adjacent room, the Salon Carré, so this is, a square, um, this is a square carpet, and again, nine by nine meters, a huge carpet. It would just about, I think, fit into this uh, room. Uh, I was able to see it once in the flesh. It's in Naples. Um, I was very lucky they rolled it out for me especially. Um, and it shows um, at the center, you've got the, 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 the Sun King, and here you would have had the arms of France and Navarre and the royal crowns. The carp, some of the carpets were sold after the French Revolution, 
um, and then were mutilated. So the royal arms, all the royal symbols were taken out. This carpet was actually uh, um, Napoleon wanted to use in Rome, but then um, Joachim Murat took it away from Rome to Naples, which explains why it's there now. But the key thing is, in the corners, you have depictions of the four continents of the world, the, the allegories of four continents of the world. So here you have um, the Americas, and then you have Europe, and then you have um, Asia and um, Africa. And that really, again, is that idea of the superlative as the king of France at the center of um, the world. And I'd like to finish with uh, um, probably the most complete work of art that, um, that Lebrun created, and that is the ambassador staircase at Versailles. This is a model from the 1950s of the space that was actually destroyed in the 1750s because the, um, the glass roof leaked, and also Louis XV needed more space for his daughters. So they pulled the whole thing down. But until then, it was probably one of the, most, the grandest interiors um, in, in France. And what you have is a bust of Louis XIV at the center. You would have come in as an ambassador here, looking up to this bust, high, high up. And then left and right, you had these, um, you had these depictions, the tableau depictions of the four continents of the world, all there to witness the grandeur of the French court. So here, um, they're roughly done according to the four corners of the world. So you have here, you have uh, Europe, and then the matching allegory up there. And here you have, uh, that is the Americas. I think it's the Americas. Um, and uh, and the, the matching allegory up there. I can't really see it from here. Um, we are relatively well informed about the interior, thanks to numerous sources. So here, this is, on the left, we've got one of the uh, contemporary modellers. This is for Asia. And then here you have this fantastic cartoon, which is a huge piece of paper that was used to stencil in the, the drawing uh, on the building site. But we also have, uh, we have a, a set of fantastic contemporary uh, engravings. And you have, again, here uh, France there. Uh, well, that's supposed to be Europe, but the shield is of France. And that's because uh, we also have a pamphlet, yet again, written by André Philippien that describes uh, the space as the grandest space in the world for the grandest and most powerful monarch in the world by the greatest artist. Um, but it also says that, that here we have a depiction of Europe and France, because obviously France is, or the French are the most distinguished of all the nations of um, Europe. And that, that so, so, so this is a perpetual um, superlative, but it's also um, a great praise of Lebrun, how he manages to bring all the arts and all the world together in one space. And it was, as I said, used for um, the great entrances, entrances of foreign envoys to, um, to, uh, to Versailles. And I always like to think of it like, a, like an interface between the, the microcosm of Versailles and the, the macrocosm of the rest of the world. So you have here two depictions of the uh, ambassadors of Siam. Uh, meeting Louis XIV here, seated on his silver throne, and here, those of Genoa. And um, just sort of as a publicity for my colleagues at the Metropolitan Museum, there is going to be a fantastic exhibition on visitors to Versailles, and especially ambassadors to Versailles, opening at the Met uh, in April uh, next year. And then there's the Hall of Mirrors. Uh, this is Le Brun's last great um, work, uh, and he, uh, and he designs the whole decoration of the vaults. And I use it at the end of the book, at the illustration of the back of the book, and the Queens of Persia at the front, because it's really the two book ends of his career at the French court. This is the last great work. And at the beginning of the reign of Louis XIV, and as it were, at the beginning of the reign of Lebrun, he has to portray Louis XIV as someone else, because Louis XIV hasn't achieved anything yet. Whereas at Versailles, in the a Hall of Mirrors, it's just Louis XIV, surrounded by all his achievements uh, and, and this visual uh, propaganda. And it's also very much the end of his career because um, when, uh, so Le Brun decorates the Hall of Mirrors at the beginning of the uh, 1680s. And in 1683, his great supporter, Colbert, the first minute of Louis XIV, dies. And between 83 and Lebrun's own death in 1690, his, the last stretch of his career is a struggle because Colbert's successor, the Marquis de Louvois, is a supporter of Lebrun's greatest rival, Mignard. So 
Le Brun really, really struggles to keep his powerful position as the king's uh, principal artist. Um, and one uh, element of that is that at the, end, at the very end of his life, Louis XIV has to decide to melt down all the silver furniture, which Colbert would have never done. So this whole room was lined in solid silver torchères. So everything you see here in gilt wood would have been solid silver, as well as solid silver tables. All of that was melted down, and Le Brun dies um, two months later. Now, why is this relevant to us today? Well, I must admit that when I first started working on the subject, I didn't care whether it was relevant to us. It was relevant to me. Um, I wanted to um, work on Le Brun, and I was interested in Versailles. But as I was rereading the um, proofs of my book uh, last year, I, uh, suddenly, it suddenly occurred to me that it's actually much more relevant um, than I cared to think until then. We have witnessed over the last 18 months or two years some considerable political changes, not only in the United States, but also in Britain and indeed in continental Europe. Um, and uh, thinking about these changes, um, I um, thought, you know, it's very obvious that um, we think of, uh, that, that politicians today still use images and text, maybe in a different way. They don't, they're not elaborate pamphlets published in the Mercure Galant, they may be just tweets. Um, and I'm not suggesting here that, um, that any of our uh, political leaders would ever attempt to uh, portray themselves in the way that Louis XIV did. But there are, there are recurrent themes and re recurrent subjects like sovereignty. How do you depict sovereignty? What is um, sovereignty about? Supremacy. Um, but also this idea of superlatives, you know, the greatest monarch of the universe, the greatest country in the world. I, um, I went to lecture at the Royal Academy a couple of years ago uh, uh, by the Dean of St. Paul's, and he ended his lecture saying that obviously London was the greatest city in the world, which I must admit rather surprised me, uh, but it was much more, much more to the surprise of a lady in the audience, an American lady who got up and said, how could you possibly say London's the greatest city in the world when everyone knows New York is the greatest city? <laughs> um, and so this is a subject that's clearly still prevalent. I mean, I think that superlatives can be used, they can be very, very endearing. I mean, for instance, there's no question that my mother is the greatest mother in the world. Um, I, will, I won't have anyone you know, question that. Um, but I think that in a, in a political context is much probably less measurable, and um, I find it quite surprising that you might still today uh, use some uh, uh, political rhetoric that was, uh, that was relevant and prevalent um, 300 years ago. Thank you.